All right, um, we're going to go to John 15 today, but before I, and we're at verse 7, but before I get there, I want to revisit something that, well, it's been three weeks now. A lot of things have happened since then. I was commenting on verse 6, which I'll read. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And in the course of that discourse, kind of as an aside, I was talking about the fact that sometimes God forgives us for things that we do, but that doesn't erase the fact that there are consequences that we have to suffer as a result of it. And sometimes, and I even gave you an example, like in the Levites that went astray when Israel went into captivity because they fell into idolatry. And God let them back into his house and into his service, but he never let them back to his table. They could never get quite as close as they otherwise could have gotten, whereas the sons of Zadok, because they were faithful during that time, were allowed to go right up into the very inner sanctum of God's house and right up to the table of the Lord. Just showing you an example of that. And um, I pointed out that the same applies with regard to our human relationships, that We have an obligation to forgive people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go back and reestablish the kind of relationship we had before. And I gave an example of maybe two brethren having a falling out in business. And maybe they resolve their differences and forgive each other, or one forgives the other, whatever wrong he felt was done. But that doesn't mean you have to go back and do business with that person, especially if you think they're careless. And the same could be true of your personal relationships. If someone has showed themselves careless with regard to the emotional investment and the kindness that you've invested in them, you don't necessarily have to go back and reestablish that closeness. But you still have to love them, particularly as it pertains to the church, in performing to them all the kind offices of brotherly duty. Um, If they're in need, you give to them, you pray for them, you wash their feet, and so forth. But you don't necessarily have to buddy pal. Um, But there was one thing that I'd overlooked, and I want to just revisit this and drive this point home with greater clarity than I did at that time. Because exactly what do we mean when we say we forgive somebody? And I've talked about this before, but I think it bears repeating. Because not only do we have an obligation to forgive our brethren, when they repent, like if thy brother offend thee and he, or sin against thee and he say, I repent, then you forgive him. Uh, let's say a brother has offended you and, um, you and and you're really, really bothered by this. And you start pursuing a Matthew 18 with him. And let's say it's stage two. He finally says, you know, I'm, I repent. I, I regret what I did. I regret what I said. Then you've got to forgive him. The Matthew 18 procedure stops right there. You forgive him. Again, you don't have to go back and be as intimate as you were, but you've got to let it go right there. But what about somebody that, say, is not in the church? Maybe somebody in the past that mistreated you or cheated you or abused you. You know, you still even have to forgive that person. But let me show you what we mean by that. First of all, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, it'll show you what stands in contrast to forgiveness. And this is what I fail to point out three weeks ago, and when I revisited what I said, I was quite unsatisfied with this oversight, so I want to go back and revisit it. In Ephesians chapter 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I want you to notice that in this verse, forgiveness is placed in contrast to bitterness and wrath. And the word forgive literally means not to give. It means to give up resentment or claim for requital for, to cease to harbor resentment or wrath. So when you forgive somebody, you're not giving that person the bitterness and the resentment and the wrath that they deserve from you. You're just not doing it. And that's very important. Now, there's three aspects of forgiveness you have to remember. And this will help to clarify this whole subject for you. There's three aspects. There's forgiveness as it pertains to your relationship to God. 
There's forgiveness as it pertains to your relationship with yourself. And there's forgiveness as it pertains to your relationship with someone who has offended you or done you wrong. And so the forgiveness that I want to focus on here is the forgiveness as it pertains to your relationship with God and with yourself. Say somebody in the past cheated you. They never repented and you never got your money back. You never went to court about it. But you still, you got the short end of the stick. You were cheated. Or maybe somebody abused you. This is really applicable to people that suffered sexual abuse in their past. And uh, when we talk about forgiving that person, we're not talking about restoring your relationship with that person. We're not talking about changing your opinion and deciding this is a wonderful person when maybe they're just as rotten and wicked as they ever were. If a person is wicked, a person is wicked, 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 wicked. And forgiveness doesn't mean that you all of a sudden have to make them out to be something other than they are. Do you understand? That's not what forgiveness is all about. And nor does this step of forgiveness require you to drop any legal charges you may have against that that person if they've committed a crime punishable by law. Maybe the injustice they inflicted on you, they inflicted on several people. And you may be called in court as a witness. You can go in that court, bear witness, talk about the terrible thing they did to you, and pray to God they get justice. And yet at the same time, forgive them. Forgive them. Because what we're, what we're talking about in this step is what you need to do to deal with your anger, anger and your bitterness. Because as long as you harbor anger and bitterness and wrath against that person, you stay emotionally tied to them. The person you stay angry with is a person that is controlling you and haunting you day and night. So what you've got to do is you've got to take that anger and that wrath and you have got to give that to God and get it off of you. Anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Again, this is not pertaining to your relationship with that person or the opinion you have of them. This is talking about your relationship to God and talking about the relationship you have to yourself. I think what I'm talking about is best summed up in this single verse. Romans 12, 19. Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. And the place for that wrath is not harboring it in your heart. Give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So you give that wrath to God rather than harboring it against the avenger. In this step, you give your right to take revenge to God. You're not giving your wrath to the offender. And what that does is it you lets that person. Now, now that may seem that may seem unfair because it looks like you're letting the person off the hook. But really, you're not. You're you're letting them off your hook, but you're not letting them off God's hook. Remember, he said, the vengeance is mine. I will repay what God is telling you. Let me take care of that. Don't you go around harboring all that bitterness and all that anger and just keeping you awake at night and eating your insides out. Get rid of that. Give that to God. God says, I'll take care of it. I will repay and oh, will he ever. Because as long as you harbor that wrath and bitterness, you stay emotionally tied to that person and what they did. So you have to learn to give that to God. And this forgiveness involves a choice to live with the consequences of another person's sin. But you know what? You're going to live with those consequences regardless. So you need to choose how you're going to live with them. Are you going to live with them in the pain of unforgiveness that keeps you tied to the past? Or are you going to live with the freedom of forgiveness by giving it to God and letting God take care of it? But again, as far as our personal relationships are concerned, particularly with our brethren in the church, like I say, if my brother repent, forgive him. And that means you, you give up any anger you feel, any wrath you feel, and you continue to love that person and, and deal with them as the Bible requires you to do in the church. But like I say, it doesn't require that we all be 
really familiar, intimate buddies with everybody. That's not the requirement here. You're certainly within your rights to protect your emotions, just like you're within your rights to protect your property and to protect your person from further injury. We all have that right to do that. Uh, but, I mean, if you, if you want to res- maintain the closeness in the relationship and give the person another chance, that's your choice. You know, you, you make your choices in that, in that particular situation. But uh, those were just some thoughts I, I, I felt it was important to, uh, to mention to you. And also, with regard to this thing of forgiving another, if somebody offends you and you forgive them, you don't keep bringing it up to them. Don't keep reminding them every time you see them. You did this to me. You did this to me. If you're doing that, you haven't let it go. And when you forgive somebody, you've got to learn to quit bringing it up to yourself and playing it over and over and over in your mind because that just keeps you tied to it. And you don't move ahead. And we want to move ahead. We want to grow. And unforgiveness is something that will greatly hinder that and give Satan an advantage against us. So I thought that was a point that I needed to revisit and uh, elaborate on a little bit more by exactly what we mean when we say we forgive someone. So anyway, let's go back to our passage now in John 15, pick up where we left off after that little bit of a, of a, of a rabbit chasing. The subject, abide in Christ, abide in me and I in you, and you shall bring forth much fruit. Jesus says, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, this is John fifteen seven. ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Notice how Jesus links the issue of his words abiding in us with the issue of us abiding in him. And he puts those two things together. Therefore, I can say to you that if God's words, Jesus' words, are not abiding in you, you are not abiding in Christ. Simple as that. So this lets all of us know that there is more to Christianity than just sitting and listening to sermons. There's a whole lot more to it than just coming here, warming a seat, and listening to a sermon. The words of Christ need to abide in us. They need to continue and remain in us rather than just go through us, as we say, in one ear and out the other. And this, of course, links neatly with Colossians 3.16, where we've already visited this verse. Let the word of Christ dwell. Let it stay. Let it continue. Let it remain in you richly in all wisdom. It also lines up, if we could look at it from a negative angle, with Hebrews 2.1 that says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed, which means this is something that you're going to really have to pay attention to. You're going to have to work at this one. You're going to have to be really extra careful in this area and get serious about it. That's what that word earnest means. And therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed, the more serious, careful, close attention to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. They just go right out of our head. That's not Christ's words abiding in us when we're letting them slip. And the effect of Christ's word abiding in us is this. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. In other words, the effect of Christ's words abiding in us is key to our prayers becoming effectual. So if you sense that your prayer life is becoming ineffective, then examine your relationship to the words of Christ. Are they abiding in you? Because if they are, you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done. That's the condition. Now this promise... Ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you, reminds us of the words of John. The same thing is echoed in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. The author of the Gospel of John that recorded these words of Jesus later wrote these words. So there's a connection. They got the same, like I say, the same author of the two books. In one, he's recording the words of Christ. Now he's writing what the Holy Spirit is giving him about those words. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, this is the confidence that we have. I would ask you this morning if you have this confidence. That we have in Him. 
that if we ask anything, that kind of lines up with Jesus said, you shall ask what you will. If we ask anything, and here's the, here's the catch, according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, we, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If God hears you, you're going to get what you ask for, whatever it is. So this promise, ask what you will and it shall be done unto you, is echoed in this promise of 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Anything whatsoever we ask that is according to God's will, we will have. Now, the first thing is if we're going to pray according to God's will, we've got to figure out what is God's will in order to be able to ask accordingly. And I have taught you this over and over and over and over again, and I'm about to say it again. We have a responsibility to understand the will of God. We have a responsibility to know it. As we're told in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now the question is, where am I going to get that understanding of what God's will is so I can know how to pray according to His will? Well, the answer to that is very easy. Psalm 119 and verse 104 just flat out tells us how we get this understanding. Psalm 119, 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, and therefore I hate every false way. This is where we get the understanding of the will of God. And understanding that, when we ask according to this, we can have confidence that we have the petitions we desire of Him. You see, it works like this. If the words of Christ are abiding in us, like He said, if they're staying in us, remaining in us, so that they're worked into our thought processes and how we act and react to life, What those words are going to do is they're going to shape our desires. They're going to influence our goals so that we will be asking according to the will of God because our desires will be shaped accordingly. You got it? The words abiding in you are going to influence what you want out of life. Your desires, what's most important to you, and that's going to influence how you pray. And when you pray accordingly, you'll have what you ask for. So when we pray according to the scripture, we can be assured that our prayers will be heard. Let me give you some examples of what it is to pray according to the scripture. To give examples of scriptural prayers that we can adopt for our own. And just stay with this point, it's an important one. Come over to Psalm 119, and with the exception of four verses, every single verse in Psalm 119 is a prayer. In some of the verses of Psalm 119, the psalmist is asking God to give him something, to do something for him. In other verses, the psalmist is telling the Lord what he's going to do, what's going on in his life, or he's talking about what other people are doing. So that in the prayer, the psalmist, or in this psalm, the psalmist is bringing God into every aspect of his life. What he's thinking, what he's feeling, what he's intending, what he's done, what he will do, what he wants to do, and also acknowledging what God is doing in his life and what God is like. That, 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 that's the essence of fellowship. And that's what we have going on in Psalm 119. Like I say, with the exception of four verses, every single verse is worded in the form of a prayer. And I'm going to give you some examples of of prayers that you can have confidence. If you pray this, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. Because this is praying according to the will of God revealed in His Word. I'll give you one example. Uh, Verse 17 of Psalm 119. Of course, you know I wrote a commentary on Psalm 119. I've got extensive comments on all of these verses. And this is the first one I did after I got back from the Philippines. I took a break. when I made that trip to the Far East. And so this was the first one that I commented on when I got back. Deal bountifully with thy servant so <laughs> that I may live and keep my word. So this is asking God to deal with me lent- liberally, generously, 
plentifully. And so that's a big petition. You're asking God to be real liberal and real generous with you. And so he begs for, I'm going to read some of the stuff I wrote. He begs for liberal, plentiful, abundant supplies from God. He brings a large petition for a very simple reason. He's addressing a very large God. (laughs) You can bring large petitions because you're addressing a large being. And God has large amounts to give. After all, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24, 1. It is his to give as much as he will to whomsoever he will. All things seen and unseen belong to the Lord. And just, I went through and gave you several verses. I'm not going to recite them off now. You can look them up on, you can look up my article and read on it. Psalm 119, 17, the comments I made on them. God is abundant in goodness and truth. Oh, I'll go ahead and give you the reference. He's abundant in goodness and truth. Exodus 34, 6. He has a multitude of loving kindnesses and tender mercies and loving kindnesses to bestow. Psalm 51, 1. He's got plenteous redemption. There's no lacking of power with him to deliver. Psalm 137. He abundantly pardons. Isaiah 55, 7. And considering the abundance of my sin, I certainly have a great need of that. An abundance of that I certainly need. He, his grace is exceeding abundant. 1 Timothy 1.14 And our Savior came into this world that we might have life and have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10. And because of His riches and glory, we have the promise our God shall supply all our need. Philippians 4.19 Indeed, as Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. It is no imposition upon God to ask Him to deal bountifully with us. But look at why. Look at why He asks God to deal bountifully with Him. Get this is, the, this is the hook. This is the key. Deal bountifully with me that I may live and keep Thy word. Now... Lord, I want to live. But why do I want to live? So I can see my grandkids grow up? So I can retire and take vacations with my wife? Or so I can, uh, uh, um, oh, I don't know. I've just thought of those couple of things. That's enough to illustrate what I'm talking about. Because if you listen to people talk, very often that's their reason for wanting to live. He says, but deal bountifully with me that I may live. For what reason? And keep thy word. Now, you think God's going to deny you that petition? I mean, if your aim in life is to live for what God said, you think he isn't going to deal bountifully with you? You better bet he is. You can have confidence when you pray like that. God's going to deal bountifully. I mean, you're going to have everything you need and more. He will deal bountifully. Or then another good example is verses 33 through 40. Just to give you, just to give you an, an insight into what it is to, to pray according to the scripture, according to the will of God. He says, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. I mean, that's, a, that's a prayer. Lord, help me to learn the Bible. Teach me the way of thy statutes and I shall keep it unto the end. You think he's going to deny you that? Give me understanding and I shall keep my law. You think he's going to withhold that if you really want it? And I shall observe it with my whole heart. But see, notice the deal. You give me the understanding, I'm going to do something with it. I'm not going to pack all this information in my head and it not make a difference in how I live. You know, if if God's not giving you understanding, if he's not teaching you, if your education in God's word has come to a standstill and you're not getting anything out of the sermons anymore and you read the Bible and it's just not doing anything for you, maybe you need to consider the second half of the petition. I'll keep it under the end. And I'll observe it with my whole heart. Maybe you're not keeping your end of that bargain. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. I don't want to live my life uh, with I want, I want, I want, I want. I've told you this before. My father's family, and I don't, I don't regret being a mot, but I'll tell you this about them. They were very materialistic people. Very, not religious people generally. Very materialistic. And you'd sit around and listen to them talk. And it was always, of course, they were southern. So this is the way they said it. I won't. 
I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. They're always talking about what I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. I grew up listening to that. And it just echoes in my mind to this day. But the psalmist is praying not to live like that. Incline mine heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetous. I don't want a heart that's just constantly after what I want. Let me put it back in middle. Midwestern English it sounds better, doesn't it? I want, I want, I want. And he says, and turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. And God knows there's plenty of it thrown in our faces every day with all these screens everywhere we turn. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken me in thy way. Energize me, Lord, in the way of the Christian. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. You know, let, let me see these promises fulfilled in my life since I'm devoted to fearing thee. And you will. And then I love this one. Turn away my reproach, which I fear. Lord, don't let me live in such a way that I'm going to bring disgrace to the name of Jesus Christ, to the church, to the ministry, to my family. I, I have prayed to God and I have said this, that it is much easier to bury someone in a grave than it is to bury them in disgrace. It was a whole lot easier to dismiss Mike from the membership of this church via death than via an exclusion. Far and away, much better, much easier, much to be preferred to graduate out of the church of God with honor instead of with reproach. But we've all got that capacity in us. And that's why we need to say, turn away my reproach, which I fear. For thy judgments are good. This book's too good for me to not live by it. You think God won't hear that prayer if you really mean it? Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Energize me, Lord, to do the next right thing, to do what's right. Now, you get an idea of what it is to pray according to the Word of God. When you pray prayers like that, well, you're doing exactly what the Son of God taught you to do in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And this applies to what you pray for as much as what you live for. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the right thing. And all these things, food, raiment, shelter, shall be added unto you. You'll get all that other stuff tacked on with what you've asked for in the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I'll give you the classic example of that if you'll come to 1 Kings chapter 3. Because this prayer for wisdom, understanding, knowledge, to do what God wants, to do the will of God, is exactly what motivated the prayer of Solomon. But I want you to see what happened. In 1 Kings 3, 9, God came to Solomon and said, Ask what you will, and I'll give it to you. I mean, a blank check. <laughs> that, that was quite something. A blank check. You just ask me what you will and I'll give it to you. And this is what he asked. In verse 9, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great pe a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, watch it, and hast not asked for thyself long life. Neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked for the life of thine enemies. If God came to you this morning and said, Ask what you will, and I'll give it to you. Have you got an enemy? Say, oh boy, here's my chance. Lord, zap her. Zap him. Here's your chance. Would you jump on that? Zap him. The <laughs> Lord comes and says, let's ask what you will. Give me 15 more years of life, Lord. Is that what you'd ask? Or give me a raise. Or let me win the lottery. Is that what you'd ask? Would you say, Lord, give me a wise and understanding heart to make good decisions? That's what Solomon asked for. And that pleased the Lord. And he says, I've done according to thy words. Lo, I, watch it now, have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. Now Solomon had asked God to give him that. 
And God, when he responds to the prayer, uses the present perfect tense to indicate, I've already done it. Because you see, for somebody to ask for a wise and understanding heart shows they've already got one. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? God had answered the prayer before he prayed it. So that there was none like thee before thee, neither shall there after thee shall arise any like unto thee. And uh, by the way, Solomon, because you asked that, I've also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, and there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. So you see, it's amazing what God will tack on when you pray prayers according to his will. When you get your value system straightened out and what your main desire from God is, it's amazing all the other stuff he'll tack on. Like he might give you a long life and good health and plenty of money and, and he might zap that person after all. You know, the Bible says don't rejoice when your enemy fall, lest the Lord see it and you turn away his wrath from him. So don't get too happy when the opposing team loses, the one you don't like. The Lord may turn his way his wrath from them and let them win and you lose. <laughs> oh no, I wouldn't I had didn't have furthest thought from my mind. I'm using it as I'm using an example mind. Uh, pretty well anything. But uh you get the you get the idea here. You get the idea. I tell you what, though. I'll tell you what. And I'm dead serious about this. Don't you ever get so serious about sports that when the team you don't like is gaining ground, you pray things like, Lord, let their quarterback break his leg. Don't you ever, ever, ever do that. That's evil. That's evil. You don't do that. You don't wish evil on people like that. I mean, it, it, I'll tell well. <laughs> I'll get to that point later. I've got that. I've got something I want to say about that a little bit later. I don't want to come to that now. I want to stay with this point of praying according to the will of God. Let me give you another hint. And this is one that I can say before God I, I adopt as a practice. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, just teaching you how to pray according to the will of God. And when you pray like this, and again, you're going to pray like this if Christ's words are abiding in you because they're going to be shaping your desires. And what you most want out of life. Here in Philippians 4 and verse 9, Paul says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And these things would include Paul's prayers, of which we have several recorded in his epistles. And when you pray prayers according to the prayers of Paul in his epistles, and you adopt them for your own You will pray according to the will of God because he was praying those prayers under inspiration. And I do that. I'll give you just an example in Colossians chapter 1 because I'm going to make a confession to you. I am an overseer of over a hundred people. And those hundred people, I'm not me, I don't mean to be belittling, but you have so many problems. (laughs) See, I'm gagging on them. (coughs) You have got so many issues. And so many problems. And it isn't just you that have your names on the book. It's your families and your kids and this and this and this. And then try to pray about our nation and our government and our leaders and other things like that. And I, I, this little brain just can't hold it all. And sometimes I find myself reluctant to want to pray because it's such an overwhelming task to go down the list. But you know, I don't have to do that. Oh, I do it some. And usually on my day of prayer that I have every summer, I get the church list out. And when nobody's around, I start walking through and I name every single person and what I can think of. But I'll tell you what I've learned. I don't have to go before God and name off every single problem that I know you have. Because when I pray prayers like Paul, like I'm going to give you an example of right here. That Paul prayed. Do you realize how many needs that covers? 
You realize how comprehensive this is? This is going to take every one of you and any and everything you're dealing with and touch it. I can just take the church list and hold it up in one hand before God and then pray this prayer and it'll all, I'll get it covered. It just like this. This is a favorite one of mine in Colossians 1. And I pray the other ones too. But this is just, I'm just trying to instruct you in how you can ask according to the will of God and be sure you get what, be assured, have confidence, you're going to get what you ask for. In verse 9, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And I, and I do pray for you people. I want you to know that. I, I do that. I keep it up. And to desire, and I really want what I ask for, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You realize how many issues that solves for people if they just know what God wants them to do? That they have the wisdom and understanding that comes from the Spirit of God to know how to make the best decisions in a given situation. That's going to fit right within the framework of God's revealed will for our lives. And that you want worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, so that every direction you take in your life pleases God to the ultimate. You notice how much that's going to help your life if God does that? And be fruitful in every good work. All that ninefold fruit of the Spirit bearing itself in every work that you do. And doing every good work that God has called you to do. And increasing in the knowledge of God so that you're constantly getting to know the Lord better and better. Strengthened with all might. Boy, doesn't that cover a lot. Don't we all need strength and energy? To get through this life, to do what God wants us to do, and to get all the might that God gives according to His glorious power. And boy, this one's going to take in a lot. Unto all patience. And who of us couldn't stand more of that? To deal with the tribulations of life. And long-suffering. And be able to bear suffering patiently for a long time and never lose our joy in the process with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father, being a thankful people that know how to count our blessings, not one of the greatest of which, that He's made us meet, worthy to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That God Almighty made me worthy to be a member of the church of Jesus Christ and to be thankful for that. Do you realize that if those petitions are realized in your lives, the quality of your life, the quality of your life, Your ability to handle the difficulties that life throws at you. Your ability to cope. Your ability to be a a, a luminous witness for Christ in the world in which you live. You realize how much is going to get taken care of under those petitions. And so I, I pray things like that for you. I'm always praying for God to make you perfect in every good work to do His will. And to use whatever means he has ordained to bring about that perfecting, whether it be tribulation or chastening or instruction or reminders or whatever means he's pleased to use. So I do those things. I'll tell you a big one that I pray a lot for this church sometimes. Sometimes when I'm going to bed at night and, and I just some of the problems come washing over my head. And I'll just say what Paul said in the last chapter of Galatians. Let mercy and peace be upon the Israel of God. And I'll say let that be on this little portion of thine Israel that I serve. So you see, when you familiarize yourself with the Scriptures and you see how the Bible writers prayed and and the thrust of their petitions, then you learn how to pray according to the will of God and then that fits right in where Jesus says, if you ask, you get. Whatever it is. Because you've learned how to ask. But on the other hand, heed this warning that's given in Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse... uh, Nine. He that turneth away his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. You know, p- people have crazy ideas about prayer. I've talked about this before. And they have this idea that the more people they have praying for them, the better chance they stand of getting whatever it is they need. 
Where do you come up with an idea like that? The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, one availeth much. It's not how many people are praying for you, it's what kind of people are praying for you. And you've got a bunch of people out there that you've showed them the King James Bible is the Word of God and teaches a doctrine of grace, and they say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to check about it. And yet you've got a problem. They say, I'm praying for you. I wouldn't get much comfort in that. I wouldn't think, oh, wow, that's wonderful. No, it ain't, because it isn't. Because their prayer isn't getting through. I can tell you that right now. I mean, not that their prayer is going to hurt you, but I can tell you that's not going to be the one God listens to. The one God listens to is going to be the one that lets Christ's words abide in them. That's the man you want praying for you. You want an Abraham making intercession like Abimelech did. That's what you want. And then there's this, and this will bring me to the point I said a moment ago, I was saving for this one. And that's James chapter 4 and verse 3. James 4, 3. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Praying prayers just to satisfy old carnal lusts and desires, that don't expect God to hear those. And that brings me back to what I was saying about sports. Yeah, I'm a Wolverines fan. And yeah, I wish they would beat up on the Buckeyes. I'd like to see them beat them one of these years. I thought for sure we had it this year and we got slaughtered. But let me tell you something I do not do. I do not pray for them to win. I don't do it and I don't advise you doing that. That's to consume it on your lusts. Sports aren't that important. They just simply aren't. And they really aren't to me. You know the, way, you know the take I, I had on that when it was over with? We all know what Greg deals with. And if it brought a smile to his face and brightened his day a little bit, then I'm glad they won. And you know my son-in-law, Jared, he's a Buckeye fan. But I think deep down, he really wanted the Wolverines to win this this year. You know why? He said, you deserve one. (laughs) And I appreciated that. What What a kind... Way to be. You deserve one. He he, he would like for me to be happy about that. And you know, I appreciate that. What a fine son-in-law there. And um, anyway. Your grandson thinks the opposite. Well, I don't care what my grandson thinks at this point. (laughs) No, I know he he was quite happy. But he was nice about it. The Wolverines were slaughtering us. And I was over there suffering. And he'd reach his hand on my shoulder and go... (laughs) comforting me in my grief. Oh, we have fun with it, but you know, at the end of the day, frankly, my dear, I don't care. People put too much stock in that, like it's the great end all. It isn't. And don't you begin to think that it is. The great end all is serving God and keeping His commandments. And I want to I say this to you parents that have your kids involved in sports. Nothing wrong with that. I had a daughter that was quite athletic. She played softball. She played soccer. I used to like to watch her play her softball games. And I can understand the idea that it's good for kids to learn how to play on a team and and work together with other teammates to achieve a common goal. But you always, you don't want to get them too carried away in that. You want to keep a right on that. Because I had two daughters that weren't in sports. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't think it made a dime's worth of difference in their character, whether they were involved in it or whether they weren't involved in it. And I want to tell you, you want to talk about something that's going to build character. Far and away more than playing on a ball team is maybe taking them to visit an aged church member or do some favor for a widow Or maybe go spend a little time with Shannon, rub his legs and massage his feet because he suffers. Maybe feed him his lunch. Things like that go a long way to build Christian character as opposed to, you know, playing well as a team and winning the game. And woo! Think about that. And don't you forget it. All right, now... So another thing, if we want, we want to be sure again, we're praying according to the will of God, because this is how we know God hears us. 
That's like Jesus said, you let my words abide in you, then you'll ask what you will and it'll be done to you. Um, you greatly err, brethren, greatly err. If you pray for something that runs contrary to what God has revealed in his word, you do. Uh, for example, let me give you two passages. Um, Proverbs 27. You want to pray according to the word of God. That's how you know you'll get what you ask for. But when you start praying things that run contrary to the book, don't count on getting that. And people sometimes do that. In Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Your God just told you that. You don't know what a day may bring forth. Then come over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, 13 through 16. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. I want you to notice Scripture teaches very plainly. I don't know how it could have said it more clearly. We don't know what a day may bring forth. We don't know what tomorrow will bring forth. And observe that in these passages, we are not instructed to find out. Did you get that? No instruction for us to go to God and ask Him to let us know what's going to happen tomorrow. So if you start praying for God to show you what's going to happen tomorrow, you err. You're not praying according to the will of God. For God told you, you don't know. And it's, I've told you before, I've said it before, this is a quote of mine, I'm going to say it again, and I'll say it again, God let me live. The most important thing is not for you to know what will happen tomorrow, but to know how to live regardless of what happens tomorrow. Did you get that? The most important thing is not for you to know what's going to happen tomorrow, but to know how to live regardless of what happens. And so if you ask For God to give you what the scripture teaches is not yours to know. Let me tell you what you're doing. You're opening yourself up to being deceived by the devil. But when you start praying for stuff like that, that God has told you is not yours to know. He's flatly told you that and you're over there asking for it anyway. You're opening up yourself for the devil to come in and give you information about things happening tomorrow. That he will do his best to work circumstances around to see to it that it happens that way if God lets him. And then you start thinking, oh, I got this extra track. I got the inside info. All I got to do is ask God. He's going to tell me. And if you think the devil's not going to make havoc with your soul over that and yank you around, you better think again. This is why it's so important. You see, people make, again, people have crazy ideas about prayer. They think because they pray about something, whatever it is they want to do, that makes it right. Maybe you go out and you buy something and you go in debt head over heels. And there you are sweating under this crushing burden of debt. But you comfort yourself by saying, I prayed about it. You think just because you prayed about it, that that all of a sudden made it okay. No, it doesn't. Praying about things is not what makes things God's will, folks. We need to learn God's will so we can pray according to it. Rather than thinking our prayers are what shape that. It's amazing the things that people come up. I, probably prayer is one of the most misunderstood things in the whole of professing Christendom and abuse and ignorance and most ridiculous ideas people come up with about prayer. <laughs> I like the heard a black preacher one time. <laughs> he said somebody came up to him and asked him to pray for them and he said, I will if I have time. I can't pray for everybody. I can't pray for everything. I will if I get time. I like that one. (laughs) And you know what gets me? Are the people out there that won't darken the door of this church. 
I mean, they don't give two hoots in hell for what I preach in here, but they want me to pray for them. What, <laughs> what do you want me to have? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I don't know. People think, I don't know. They think a man of God's got magic dust somehow and make things happen. I mean, I've had people come up to me at the gym and ask me to pray about things. <laughs> okay, they think I fix things. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, let's go back to what Jesus said as we continue to plow through this. And John 15, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And this brings up something extremely important. And I'm going to do my best to explain this the best way I can. Because people, again, they they misunderstand this. They get this one messed up. If Christ's words are abiding in us, then then He is speaking to us in those words. This is the Word of God. This is where He speaks to us. So that if His words are abiding in us, we are hearing Him speak to us in those words, and in turn, He is hearing us when we pray. So there's this communication exchange going on where He's communicating to us, and we're communicating to Him. And that is the essence of communion. That's the essence of fellowship. And I'll show you that as we move forward. And so when God's words are abiding into us, in us, they lead us and they talk to us. But, I'm, but don't, don't, don't run away with that. Let me explain that. But let me first of all give you the passage that proves that. If you'll come over to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. This, I, I'm going to do my best to make it plain because people get messed up on this one. Big time. So it's important you understand. It's important for you to understand how God's words talk to us. How they do it. How to use the words of God that abide in us. In Proverbs 6, 20 through 23, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about that ne- thy neck. How does that sound? How does that agree with let my words abide in you? If my words abide in you. You see, you, you're keeping them in you. Proverbs 6.20 My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart. You see, you got you to gotta stay with this. It requires effort. And tie them about, about thy neck. And so notice what happens when you've got these words. You're holding on to them. They're abiding in you. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. And when thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So there we've got clear scriptural authority for the fact that these words talk to us and they speak to us. But again, it is important to understand how they do so. How to use the word of God that abides in us, because here is a fact. The Bible is made up of thousands of words. And the improper use of those words could lead us to do the most destructive, damnable, and downright stupid things. For example, supposing you hear that somebody committed suicide. And you're saying, Lord, reveal to me what thou wouldst have me to do because I'm real depressed today. What can I do about my depression? I just heard of a friend of mine that was so depressed she killed herself. What should I do with my depression? And you just let the Bible flop open and there the words seem like they blaze out of the page. Go and do thou likewise. Well, I just got my answer. God's word talked to me. You laugh. You laugh. People treat the Bible just that ridiculously. Just that ridiculously. That's not how God's words talk to us. You've got to find out what he was talking about when he said, Go do thou likewise. And he wasn't talking about committing suicide. Because you see, you have to remember that the devil and deceivers will misuse the words of Scripture to mislead. That's why it's important we know how to use them. And let me show you that. The classic example is... In the temptation of our Lord in Luke chapter 4. And what I'm just trying to show you, the devil can use these words. You've got to know how to use them. You've got to know how God talks to you. So that you understand this is God's message to me and not a misuse of the words for somebody else's message. 
In Luke 4, 9, here's the temptation we read. And the devil brought Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. And now notice he quotes the Bible. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus, just throw yourself down there. You got a Bible verse that says the angels are going to pick you up. Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's a misuse of those words. The devil certainly knows how to quote Scripture and misuse it. Look at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, what we read about deceivers. In Romans 16, 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And I want to ask you people, what better words than the words of Scripture? So deceivers will use these words. And I mean make some very fair speeches in order to deceive people. And they'll sit back and say, well, he must be right. He's quoting Scripture. It is not just, um, brethren, the question is not, does a man use Scripture? The devil can use Scripture. Any deceiver can use Scripture. The question is, how does he use it? Does he use it honestly, as the Bible teaches us to use it? Or does he use it deceptively, uh, deceptively in order to trick and trip up? Or come to 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. I think we're Mike sitting there today. I think at that last point, I would have heard, you got that right. (laughs) Because I am right about that one. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2, Paul said, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. You see, the question is, how do you handle the Word of God? You can handle it rightly, but you can handle it deceitfully. And the devil's a master at it. So it's important to understand how he talks to us. Because the devil can take those words and scramble them around or misapply them. And we think God's talking to us when he's not. The devil's misusing them. So we don't, we're not handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You see, to understand what God's words are saying to us, and they do speak to us, but to understand what they're saying, we must study and search the Scriptures employing the methods God has given. As Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the Scriptures. For in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. You just, you need to search it out. Search these passages out. Compare spiritual things with spiritual. Think, meditate, reason it out. Or as Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can misdivide. You can misapply the word of truth. So we want to rightly divide. We want to break it down into its component parts and examine it for exactly what it is saying according to the method that we've taught you and utilized over these years in Nehemiah 8.8. And I'll give you examples here. Just stay with me. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about so that you don't miss the point. But in Nehemiah 8.8, 8, we read they got the law of God and they, we read the Levites had it there on this day. They had this great service and they got the law of God out and they opened it up. And we read they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense. There's the primary meaning of the words and caused them to understand the reading. And so on down in verse 11, the people had great mirth because they understood the words that were declared unto them. So you've got to look at what exactly the words are saying. You understand them in their primary meanings. You see how you connect with other words that you understand that way to get the sentences. And from that you get the overall context to know exactly what it is saying so that you don't take it and misapply it. In other words, brethren, to illustrate what I'm talking about. 
You do not gain understanding of the will of God through the Scriptures simply by dropping the book open, reading the first thing that comes to your eyes, and then it just burns into your heart, and you think, oh, God just told me what He wants me to know, or what He wants me to do. Say, for example, say, for example, supposing I have a heart attack. Let's say I have a very serious heart attack. And there I am lying in the hospital. And I'm wondering what my future is going to be now that I've had this heart attack. Am I going to live? Am I going to get over this? Am I going to be able to continue my ministry? And I'm praying to God about this. And then I happen to open my Bible. And I'm praying to God and I read along. And these words seem like they just jump out the page at me. And my heart is strangely warm. And I read, I will add unto thy years, I will add unto thy days 15 years. And I say, hallelujah. God just told me I'm going to live 15 more years. No, he did not. He said that to Hezekiah. He wasn't talking to Ben Mott about his heart attack. But you would be surprised. You would be surprised. You see, that's when you're studying the scripture, you've got to look at, you've got to pay attention to who is talking, to whom, about what, when, where, and why. You don't gain understanding by a willy-nilly application of verses to circumstances that bear no relation to the context of the verse. I mean, I could, I could go over here to Philippians. You know, let's say I've had that heart attack. And uh, I'm wondering, am I going to survive this? Am I going to be able to keep up my ministry? And I go over to Philippians, talks about uh, better to depart and be with Christ. And I, I happen upon these words in verse 24. And as I read these words, my heart is strangely warm. It's like they, they just jump out the page and grab me. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So there's my proof. God just told me I'm going to get over this and I'm going to live and I'm going to continue to minister. You know, the most that I can get out of that verse is that if God lets me live and if God gives me the health to minister, and how am I going to know that if I keep living and getting the health? That's the only way. How how am I going to find out? You see, we want an advanced insider piece of information that says, yeah, you're going to get well. You're going to keep preaching. Now, I don't know what a day may bring forth. So the most that I conclude from that is that if I continue to live and God gives me my help, then it must be needful for me to abide in the flesh. But how long that's going to be, I don't know. I know. Imagine somebody with, with, again, let me take the, the heart attack. And, and I mean, and I could give you other examples. Supposing, supposing you're, you're thinking about, well, should I sell this car and go buy this car? And so, you know, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And so I'm reading, and my Bible flops open to James 4, and those words jump out of the page at me, go buy and sell. (laughs) I mean, again, you laugh, but people do this. This is not how God talks to us. God has spoken. So what we need to do is look at what God has said. And like, for example, when, when I, when, when way back in the early ministry in this church, I had to take a stand on the sonship of Christ. I was, I was put in a position to do that. And my whole denomination, my whole reputation in the primitive Baptist denomination was going down the tubes. I mean, I was being invited around over the country. I was, I, 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 I was gaining notoriety in the denomination, and boom, it dried up. I was slandered, and I was just frozen out. In other words, my name was, I was cast out and rejected for Jesus' sake. I was being persecuted for Jesus' sake. And I can remember during this period of time reading the 103rd Psalm where the psalmist was being persecuted. And it was like it was talking right to me. You know what it was? Because it was talking to a situation I was in like the psalmist was in for the same reason he was in it. See, now that's how it works. That's how it works. But for me to ignore the situation being described in the context of the verse and just make some wild application, no, that's not how it's done. 
I mean, imagine, again, I have the heart attack. I have the heart attack. Oh, I hope I don't. <laughs> but I, mean, I have the serious heart attack. And again, I'm wondering, am I going to survive this and be able to keep up my ministry? And then I'm reading along in Psalm 118, and the words jump out to the page, I shall not die but live. Whoa! Wow! But wait a minute, folks. You better be careful how far you run that. Because i got news for you. You're going to die still. <laughs> how far are you going to go with that? You think you're going to live forever? Well, there is a way that you can understand it to be saying exactly that. If you understand it like Jesus said it, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You realize there's an aspect of Mike Birmingham that hasn't died? If you look at it like that. But the most we could conclude from this is that in the immediate circumstances, just like say I have the heart attack and uh, then I go to the doctor six months later and says, we've got you fixed up, you're good to go. And I said, well, I guess I'm not gonna, that's not going to kill me, at least not now. I will not die but live. And so I'm just going to go declare the works of the Lord as long as I can. That's about the most I can get from that. But I've got to be careful how far I run with that to think that it's a given, this thing's never going to get me. Something's going to get me. It gets us all sooner or later. So you can see here. So when we study God's Word, we've got to pay attention to who's talking to whom about what, when, where, and why. And I hope I made that clear. So when this is happening, and I'm going to uh, try to... How long have I been up here? 106. 106. Mm. Oh. Yeah, you did. Okay, I'll give you a few more. When you're doing this, when you're studying God's Word and you're learning, and you're seeing, you're learning the will of God for your life and how to process life and the situations of life, so God is opening up your understanding of what He's already said. He's, he's communicating with you, and then you're communicating with Him, sharing your life with Him through prayer. This is the essence of fellowship. This is the essence of communion. Because when you do this, you are communing with God. Listen to the definition of the word commune. It means uh, to talk together, to converse. And that's what's happening. God is talking to you through his word and the way I've described, and you're talking to him. You're conferring, consulting with a view to a decision. You're holding intimate, chiefly mental or spiritual intercourse or communication with. And it's interesting how the Bible describes an exchange, a verbal exchange between persons as a communing. And let me give you some examples of that quickly. In uh, Genesis chapter 18, Genesis chapter 18 and we'll look at verses 23 through 33. And I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to give you an idea what's going on here. Here's Abraham talking with God. And uh, so Abraham starts out in verse 23. Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner. To slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, so Abraham talks to God, now God responds. He says, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all for the place of their sakes. And you remember the exchange, Abraham keeps lowering the number to see if God will spare for their sakes. And he finally got it down to 10. And then when the conversation between the two ended, notice what it says in verse 33. The Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. So this conversation was a communion between them. You see, that exchange of information is a verbal information is a communion. Uh, Genesis 23, 8. When Abraham is uh, negotiating with the sons of Heth for a burial place, and they're exchanging information what, and, and about this deal, and it reads in verse 8, He communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephraim, the son of Zophar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah. And so on and on and goes the, the business deal. But it's referred to as a communing. The exchanging of information is communion. Uh, Second Chronicles 9. I might be overworking this a little bit, but you'll get the point. Second Chronicles chapter 9, 1 and 2. 
And when the king, queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem. This is Second Chronicles 9, 1 through 2. With a very great company and camels that bear spices and gold in abundance and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. She presented all her questions. And Solomon told her all her questions. And there was nothing hid from Solomon which he told her not. So you see again, the verbal exchange is communion. Now, the communion can be good and the communion can be bad. When Job and his friends were having their arguments back and forth, that was a communing. Job 4 and verse 2, If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? So when two people again are having a conversation and exchanging information, they are communing. And again, that may be good, but it can also be very bad. It depends on the nature of the communion. And I'll give you a really, really bad example, and then it'll be done with these examples. Come over to Luke chapter 9. Pardon me, Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. So to commune is to exchange information. And that's why we say that when we are talking to God in prayer, and he is talking to us through his word, opening up our understanding of what he has already revealed. Did you get that? Let me say that again because that sent, that clenches it. When we are praying to God and God is opening our understanding of what he has already revealed so that our understanding is growing and he is thus, by that means, imparting to us information. We are communing with God and God with us. That's communion. That's fellowship. That's what abiding in Christ is all about. It's not about becoming a child of God. It's about having fellowship with our Father who are already children of God. Do you see that? It's fellowship. It's communion. That's the subject under consideration. And this communion binds persons together. When people have intimate and deep conversation, it builds the relationship. It binds them together. For through verbal communication, you make another a partaker of your thoughts and thus of yourself. Amen.